please welcome Thorsten. Thank you. Okay, so as uh, Hussein just introduced me, I'm going to talk about um, parallel and distributed deep learning. And, and the idea is to give all of us a, an overview over that um, rather complex field, actually. So in order to organize this a little bit more, we, we wrote a survey about that field, and, and that survey has only 60 pages. So in the next 45 minutes, I will uh, summarize this survey, I mean, the, the most important aspects of this, and I want to credit my wonderful postdoc, uh, Tal Ben Noon, who has actually been leading that effort to read more than 300 papers in order to understand the state of the art in the field. And, and I myself read about 100 of those. And we will see how that goes in a couple of minutes. So first of all, let me motivate this a little bit. I'm not sure if we need much motivation after uh, Dave's wonderful uh, talk. But I want to focus on a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, Dave was focusing on the whole thing. And the, the subset is really deep learning. So this is something that um, may or may not um, be quickly coming. But as we know, um, this uh, field was basically uh, kind of started, or at least uh, had its first big breakthrough in 1989 um, with the hand-digit recognition by Jan Le Kun, who beat all the previous benchmarks in that. And then it quickly continued in 2012 when it beat the ImageNet uh, challenge for uh, object classification. Then it was quickly followed up by um, better um, image segmentation algorithms or better ways to provide image segmentation. So the different difference between classification and segmentation is basically that in classification you want to label an image what's in the image, what's in that image, and in segmentation you want to also find the objects in the image uh, itself. So then image captioning was a, a more advanced topic, so basically saying, well, this is, uh, looks like a dinner table or maybe a lunch table. Um, then AI, we all heard about AlphaGo and uh, AlphaGo Zero. And then later in 2017, this neural computer um, idea came up that you can also use deep learning to actually implement a computation and, and Turing machine-like um, approaches. So furthermore, deep learning is basically used in every cloud industry today. So every, um, uh, every speech recognition or translation system that you can use today, even Google Translate, or uh, Skype Translate is using deep learning, and it's using all the, the methods that I'm going to explain. So the idea is, um, it's a very promising uh, area of research. Furthermore, it's a very active area of research, because of course, <laughs> that's the new hype. And as you can see, ranging from 2012 to 2017, this is the number of papers on archive in, this, um, in these two categories, artificial intelligence and computer vision, and most of them are related to deep learning. And, uh, but today, or actually yesterday, there were 23 papers a day coming out in that area. And it's actually really, really hard to follow that field if you want to stay up to date on everything. And this is why we decided to write this survey, right? So these 300 papers, and we looked at those uh, in detail. And all these papers were pre-filtered where we tried to understand um, only issues related to parallelism in deep learning. And of course, this is on a quadratic growth. If you fit a function to this, a quadratic function will fit nicely. We are in 2018, which means we have many more papers uh, a day today than we had in 2017, which also means that parts of that uh, survey is already outdated, right? But this is, this is how it goes in this field. So let me quickly summarize the technicalities of deep learning. How does it work? Well, we have an, a data set, and here I want to talk about image recognition, or image classification only, but it applies to pretty much everything else um, that is known in the context of deep learning. So just bear with me for this uh, image example. So we have a data set that has lots of labeled images. We have some kind of network structure that we run this data set through. For example, we take this cat picture, and at the end, what this cat picture here is an input to a function, f of x, and the function f of x is the network itself, right? And this function outputs, once you apply this function to the input image, outputs a probability distribution for uh, various uh, labels here in this case. So like 54% probability of this thing being a cat, 28% probability of this thing being a dog, and so on, right? And then in supervised deep learning, we have a true label, which basically says that uh, with a 100% probability, we assume that this is a cat. So some, some oracle, usually human, labeled this as a cat. Right? So this also means that the oracle, the human, is not always right. So this may, in fact, be a dog. No, it's, it's not. But <laughs> the oracle is not always right. So and the labels are nice. This is something that you need to understand. Right? So it's not 100% uh, accurate, uh, accurate. But what we do then is once we have done this so-called forward propagation, so which gives us the probability distribution, 
we then see, okay, there's an error here because it's definitely not a dog and it's not an airplane, it's not a horse and it's not all, any of these other things. Then we do a layer-wise weight update on the way back, which, which is called the backward propagation. And we repeat this process iteratively in order to compute the weights for this network, to, in order to improve the function f of x that this network implements. So to give you a little bit uh, more data, it's basically that um, these images or th these data sets that are input is what we call big data, right? So we have an image at 1K, it's about 100 gigabytes, an image at 22K, it's a few terabytes of data. And actually in industry, this is much larger. So if you look at, for example, at uh, Facebook's Instagram, we have about a trillion, um, uh, sorry, about a billion users. And if we assume that each of these users uploads um, several pictures, a couple of, uh, several pictures a month or a week, then we easily have a trillion pictures, right? So that we need to, pro or we, may, we may want to process. Furthermore, if you look at the network itself, um, that seems now smaller because these networks, they go to 100 to 200 layers deep. So here we have um, a Google Annet, which is uh, not, not that deep, it's about 20 layers. But um, there are networks that are much deeper. Furthermore, they have 100 million to 2 billion parameters, and these parameters take up to 8 gigabyte storage. So that sounds reasonable. This actually still fits on a modern GPU, right? so the full network itself. Um, However, um, there is, we can see some growth in the, in, in the networks themselves, and this is a, a picture that gives the um, number of operations required and the size of each, of each dot here is actually the number of parameters and the accuracy. So the higher, the better, right? And the more computational intensive goes to the right. What we see is actually interesting that the, um, the size, the number of parameters is somewhat growing uh, with the top one, uh, top one accuracy, but it's not necessarily that the largest network uh, achieves the highest accuracy, right? So there's some, um, uh, there some effects in there that are not easy to explain. So this is um, also due to the lack of theory in this field that is, uh, it's a very empirical study usually. Furthermore, if you look at the label space, um, we have 10 to 20,000 labels. Um, this label space is growing because if you think about face recognition, then each human would be a label, right? My name would be a label. And it takes weeks to train these networks. So if you now look at all these parameters, the conclusion we can, to, we can make is really that deep learning is supercomputing. So we need very high computational power. And this is something that, that we all know and we all agree on. Um, so this is why we're here at the end in an HPC show. So let me get a little bit more formal here. So let's assume we have a, a universe where we draw labels from that's called D. We have a subset of, uh, of labels that we call our input data set, it's called X, and a single example out of that um, subset of, of the uh, universe D, or out of our input data set, is called small x, okay? So then we have the label domain Y, which is basically all the labels that we map to, and we have a true label which comes from an oracle that is, uh, we call L of X, right? So here, this is our cat with probability one. Um, then the network itself is a function that maps an example from the input space, to, which draws out of, uh, out of the do domain of possible examples, um, to a particular label, right? So, so far, very, very simple. But what's now interesting is that this function is made up of, out of two components. And one is the network structure itself. This is what we see here. This is all these boxes and, and whatnot. This is what typically a human designs, or in the past, a human designed. And the second uh, part of that function, f of x, are the weights that are not shown in this figure. But each of these boxes has uh, parameters or, or weights that are actually needed in order to evaluate this function f of x, okay? So at the end, once we, uh, once we evaluate this function, we get this probability distribution and we have the true labels. So somehow we need to define an error function that um, gives us the, the difference between the actual guess that f of x makes and the true label that the oracle um, designed for us. So there are various error functions, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is where the uh, survey gets 60 pages. So we can have here a, a squared loss function, for example, very, very similar, a very, very simple. So we can have a zero, one loss, which is basically if the label is correct, um, we give it a zero, which is uh, no loss. And if the label is incorrect, we give it a one. Right? So then there is some loss. But what's most commonly used is actually the cross entropy um, loss function down here, which is slightly more complicated. Um, it, it also have a, has a softmax term in it, but I don't want to talk too much about the, um, about the loss functions, but you just assume that these loss functions, they somehow express how good my guess is, right? How good my forward propagation f of x, of f of x is. There are many, many more than this. And at the end, what we want to do, since we have a fixed network structure, 
what we want to do is we want to find the optimal set of weights, W star. Right? And the optimal set of weights is really easy to define. It's basically the set of weights that draws from the space of all weights where the expectation of the loss is minimized. Okay? So this is really just an optimization problem. At the end, deep learning, the learning part of it is an optimization problem. Okay? But how does this now look in practice? We have this prescribed network structure where we have a, here, for example, a convolutional layer, another convolutional layer, a pooling layer, another convolutional layer, and a fully connected layer. Just, um, well, we, we can talk about this later, why they have this particular structure. But at the end, it's really a function that is composed out of multiple functions. Each, each of those layers is one particular function. So for example, f1 of x is the first convolutional layer, and then the output of that layer is forwarded to the second function, f2, of f1 of x now, and so on. And the last layer is the overall function of the network. Right? So this is how we decompose the layer into multiple function applications using the chain rule. Okay? It's still extremely simple. So now let me get a little, a little bit more into details. How do we now optimize this function? As I mentioned, we have this optimization problem in order to find the best set of weights for your network. Right? So somehow we now need to actually do this in practice. And there are many, many ways to do this. The most prevalent way is called the stochastic gradient descent method, right? so SGD. And this is what's pretty much used um, by all of the deep learning frameworks today. So what you do here is it's an iterative method. It has T steps, or it has some other stopping condition, but typically it's a pretty fine number of steps, um, where in each step you take one random element out of your example. Okay, That's why it's called stochastic, because we take a random element out of the example. Then we do the forward propagation, so we apply the first layer, and then in a loop we apply all the other layers to the output of the previous layer. Um, and then, of course, we want to learn, we do the backward pass. We basically take the difference from the actual true label with whatever loss function we had. I mean, the difference, I mean the gradient. And we compute the actual gradient with respect to the data, which is this OI, which is the output of the previous layers. And then we also compute the gradient with respect to the weights. And this is now um, delta, um, in this case, nabla w, right, for each of the layers, okay? And then, this is where the magic comes in, we update the weights for the iteration, of the, for the next iteration, using this magic function u, right? And this function u is the major differentiating factor between uh, learning approaches. And there are many, many different functions u, and I don't have enough time to explain all of them, but the simplest one is just to use a simple learning rate, so you have a, a parameter here, eta, where you just say, well, I've, uh, it's between zero and one, and I learned so much from the new example versus the old example, but you can also make this adaptive, and you can have momentum tuning, and all kinds of different functions that, again, I don't have the time to talk about, you can look at the survey for more details. But what does this mean from a computational perspective? So this is basically a quick summary, a quick and dirty summary, by the way. I'm glancing over all kinds of details here, but I want you to have a basic understanding of what's actually happening in deep learning. So from a computational perspective, or from a storage perspective, we need to store two values at each, uh, sorry, four values at each layer. So we need to store the weights, which is kind of clear, because <laughs> you need the weights, right? You need to store the output of the layer, or of the previous layer, because you need, to, you need this output for the back propagation. You need to store the gradients of the weights and the gradients of the data. So which means if you have eight gigabyte of parameters, well, you suddenly have 32 gigabyte of values to store. So that doesn't fit your GPU anymore, right? So that's a bit of a problem. We will uh, talk about this later, how to solve this, okay? But now let's get a little bit more into the uh, details of the survey itself. So what we did is we read about these uh, about 300 papers, uh, only 227 uh, of them actually applied um, to the study. And the first statistic we did is we looked at uh, the years beginning from 2010 or from pre-2010, so deep learning really only launched um, in 29 to 2012 um, in, in, a big, uh, in a bigger environment um, until basically today. What we found is that the hardware used is, uh, has a rather interesting trend that we're moving kind of away from CPU, so it's, it's, it's a little bit noisy, but you can see the, the number of papers using CPUs for experiments, and this, again, is not representing industry, it's re representing research, is declining. Interestingly, also the number of specialized architectures is declining, even though we just had the discussion that there may be more specialized architectures, but at least in research papers in the parallel context, there are less, and GPUs are dominating the field. So this is just the data that we collected. The second piece of the data is actually that we see, uh, again, from pre-2010 until 2017, 
um, that the papers use distributed memory machines. So more than 50% of the papers today um, refer to experiments with multiple nodes involved in deep learning. And this is an interesting development. It basically shows that deep learning is largely a distributed memory problem today. So we have to care about distributed deep learning. Okay, but distributed deep learning is a little bit more complicated than deep learning because now we need to talk about things like um, node counts, how many nodes are we using, and communication, how are we communicating between these nodes. So for the node count, we have another uh, statistic again here pre-2013 to 2017, and here the number of nodes, and again, um, uh, the idea is here that this is um, the distribution of the papers we looked at in these years bin. So the first interesting insight that this is the disbelief network. Yeah, nearly 5,000 uh, 5, CPU nodes used to train the network at Google scale. Um, what you can see from this pre-2013, so this was 2012, to 2013 is that the number of nodes starkly declined. And you can guess what happened. This was when people discovered that with GPUs, you can actually lower the number of nodes uh, by two orders of magnitude and still achieve about the same performance. Right, so this was the GPU impact. Um, then it, it kept declining. But now we see a new surge going upwards. So what is that now? Well, we, we now switch to GPUs here completely, basically. I mean, as you can see in the previous statistics. But now we realized that you can actually do more things with deep learning and you can scale, and, and you need to scale this up in order to achieve that performance. So here, for example, the Titan supercomputer, uh, more than 10,000 GPUs was employed to, for very large learning problems right, in uh, the last year. So the next question is then, well, what is used as a communication mode in these uh, papers? And again, this is research, not necessarily uh, industry. So again, pre-2013 up to 2017, and we can see that MPI is dominating the, the game here. So it's also somehow interesting. So it's another piece of evidence that deep learning is really converging towards HPC as HPC is converging towards deep learning. So these are very, very similar problems, in fact, computationally. And I'm trying to make the point a little bit more uh, that this is, in fact, uh, the case. So let me look at this again, at the stochastic gradient descent that I told you before, because I lied to you, unfortunately, two slides earlier. But now we have a little bit more background that I can explain this a little bit more in detail. So I told you that stochastic gradient descent in its pure form, which is actually true, uh, picks one random element from x. But that's not what anybody does. Because if I pick one element, that's going to be very slow. What everybody does today is you actually pick a set of elements, a random subsample of all the elements. It's called a mini-batch. Right? And then you process the same algorithm on the mini-batch. What is now the difference? Well, we are not updating the weights after every single element, but we are updating the weights after B, capital B, elements only, which has two interesting effects. I mean, first of all, it seems like it should get you a worse result than if you actually update the weights after every single element. But in practice, that is not true, because in practice, my data is noisy. And in practice, what's happening is that I'm now averaging over the set of B elements, and I'm averaging out the noise. That's at least <laughs> part of the uh, theory, okay? So this actually, the accuracy is slightly increasing if I increase my B. However, if I increase my B too much, I'm losing the stochasticity because if my B is just the size of the data set, then I only have one uh, mini batch, and it's not mini batch, and it's called a batch. It's, it's called a batch method. And when I'm losing the stochasticity, I'm again losing convergence. Right? I'm again losing quality. So, and what, uh, what we um, basically found uh, in, in this study is that there are three zones with respect to the mini batch size that you can differentiate. Right? So, first of all, the validation error starts rather high because of the uh, noise in the data. When you have a too small mini batch size, right, it goes down if you have, I mean, the validation error is basically the quality of your model. It improves, uh, the inverse quality, sorry. It improves um, with larger mini batch size, going to this green area. And then if it, the mini batch size goes too large, it again declines because you lose stochasticity. Right? However, performance is, is, is simpler. Performance is just very bad if you have simple, uh, a single element. And it just keeps increasing until it saturates because your parallelism is increasing towards the right. So what you basically want to do is you want to operate here. And the reason why we don't have specific numbers in this plot is that this is incredibly problem dependent. Right? So the actual sizes you have to define based on your update function, based on your data, based on your network structure, and based on your loss function. Right? So this is uh, 
very complex to actually define the exact mini batch size. So a couple of years ago, people said, well, in the 10 niche, it's about here, so 10 niche is good. But actually, we were moving to mini batch sizes um, up to 10,000s today. Uh, there were papers that said, well, 64 is a maximum mini batch size. But again, we can push this quite far today with advanced uh, methods like momentum tuning or Nestor of momentum. Right? So there, there was actually a huge push in order to increase the mini batch size because that is our parallelism. Again, the larger you go here to the right, the more parallelism you have, the more nodes you can use. And um, the idea here was really that, um, yeah, we wanted to make this as large as possible. Right? So people invented new update functions in order to make this possible. Okay. So the, you don't lose performance. If you, if you scale more, if you have a larger mini batch, your performance will always go up. It'll just get less and less and less because at some point you just hit the maximum of your, uh, your hardware that it allows. Right? So this, this is the statistical property here, the validation error. Right? And this is the hardware performance. So in some, uh, how well are you running on your system? So you really want to operate in this area. When the validation error is not too bad, but the performance is maximum. So this is, the, this is the idea of it. Again, the exact number is actually rather complicated to tune. Um, okay, so let me now give you a little bit of background on parallelism because we will need this in a couple of minutes. It's a little bit of a, of a theory slide here. So every computation we can model as a, as a directed acyclic graph where the nodes are uh, arithmetic operations like plus minus times or whatever, and the arrows are data flow between the nodes, right? dependencies between the nodes. So if we have this graph, we can actually define two metrics, and the one metric is called the work, which is just the total number of the arithmetic operations we do. Right? It's very simple. In this case, if you count the number of vertices, you get 39. And the, the second metric is called the depth, which is basically the longest, shortest path uh, from any of the input vertices to any of the output vertices. If you see, this is seven here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they're all the same right, in, in this uh, particular diagram. So one interesting, and this is a little bit of uh, parallel computing theory here, one interesting insight we can gain from this is that the aver average parallelism in that mode is the total work divided by the depth. Right? So this is kind of a good metric for the average number of compute elements you can employ to solve that problem. Right? And we will, we will see how that relates to deep learning soon. A second case we need to understand is a little bit of communication theory. So we need to understand, well, we need these parameter updates um, that I will talk about in a couple of minutes, they need global reductions. And the idea is of a global reduction is very, very simple, is we have lots of values, x1 to xn, and we want a global sum of these values, okay? Extremely simple problem. Um, there are many ways to do this, so the simplest way to do this is you have a, a, a parallel tree, where basically the, we have four different values here, x1, x2, x3, and x4, x1, x2, x3, and x4, and then the colors are different compute elements, and we want to reduce them, so we sum these two, we sum these two, we have one value, but at the end, all the nodes need that value, so we need to broadcast it again, right? Then you can write down the, the time that needs, L is the latency of the network, um, log base two P, P is the number of processing elements, and here in this case, uh, gamma and m is just the size of my message, okay? So you, you get that piece. You can easily half that um, with a more advanced algorithm, it's called the butterfly algorithm. So basically get rid of these factors of two here, so then uh, this is relatively simple. But the problem here is actually that you get rid of these factors of two, but you still have the bandwidth, the, the gamma times m, which is the size, times log 2p, which is not good, right? There is an, another algorithm where you can basically send this along a pipeline mode, where you see that the bandwidth itself is, a const, is, is times a constant, right? or a very small value, p minus one divided by p, basically a constant, basically one uh, for large enough p. But you still have now, the logarithmic term in, uh, of the latency is now a linear term here, right? So that's also not too good, great. So this was, by the way, the algorithm that Baidu was very happy about, um, that they uh, released multiple press releases as the deep learning um, reduce algorithm. Um, but there is a better algorithm known from the HPC field, uh, which is uh, often called the robbins eifner algorithm or the reduce scatter plus scatter algorithm, which has the logarithmic term in the latency and the um, constant term in the bandwidth. So this is the optimal one. And we can say basically for small vectors you want to use this uh, algorithm, and for large vectors you want to use this algorithm. In fact, if you look at the theory, you will find that the rightmost algorithm is optimal in terms of latency with a factor of two and in terms of bandwidth uh, strictly optimal. So great, we actually don't need to do much uh, research here to improve this, yes? This is that you do it on the computer. Yes. Not on the 
Well, on, on the network, it's going to be the same, just that these, that these things are switches and not, uh, not end nodes. Um, yes, yes it, it gets, no, actually, no, there, there are still switches here, right? So if, if you see that these are the switches, the bandwidth is not necessarily going down. Yes, but it's the same here. It's the same here. So, so here the data also goes down. It's, it's, you do the same. You just reduce by a constant, essentially. And you know it's all much faster. I mean, the switches are much faster in reduction. So, but, but yes, the, the math doesn't really change that much. Um, OK, so, so there's this algorithm that gives you the lower bound. And um, this is something that we have actually discovered in the HPC field, right? So this is something that we should understand that there's a good opportunity for tech transfer into the deep learning field. But now let me get a little bit more into detail of what these networks actually do. So this is Google Annette. Um, one of these networks, and again, there are many, many of these networks. This is just one that's uh, relatively easy to show. And if you look at this from the left to the right, I mentioned this is this function f of x that uh, implements that transformation. And if you just look at the subset of this, we find all kinds of different things here like uh, the output of the previous layers, convolutions, uh, max pooling, concatenation, and all kinds of different boxes, right? all kinds of different layer types. And in fact, um, these layer types are, there is a huge flurry of them, and I just want to talk about some of them in terms of parallelism within the layer. Usually what you do with these layers is you, you process them on a GPU. Right? The GPU implements uh, threat level parallelism, so SIMT, and you exploit that parallelism in that layer. For example, if you have an activation layer, which is a very, very simple layer, it's just a point-wise um, point function that you apply, and we're looking at work and depth here. And what you do is the work is really proportional to n, which is the mini-batch size, c is the number of channels in your picture, and it's again specific to pictures, h and w is the height times the width of the picture. Basically, the number of pixels you have in the picture, multiply it, by uh, the mini batch size. Right? Now you can see that if the mini batch size gets larger, my parallelism gets larger. The depth is one. Right? Great. So my average parallelism goes up like crazy. Let's do this for the other networks uh, rather quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, so for the fully connected network, it's very similar. So here we have basically C out of the previous layer, C in of the next layer, and again the mini batch size here. So linear in the mini batch size. And only a logarithmic. Um, um, only a logarithmic uh, depth here, right? So again, uh, the convolution is very similar. Let's get some more equations here. Kx and Ky are basically the size of the convolution stencil in the x and the y direction. And then here it's all logarithms, sums of logarithms. If you look at the pooling layers, again, uh, relatively similar. So NCHW and the logarithm here. And the last one is a batch normalization layer, which is applied to, well, normalize the batches, right? So what you do in the normalization, you sum them all up, and then you divide it by the number of batches, which gives you the logarithmic depth. And again, the work is NCHW. So the basic conclusion from this is that you have a huge amount of parallelism at each layer. But this parallelism is extremely fine-grained. So this is why GPUs work so well for the layer computation, right? Okay, so let me look at one particular layer here. So this is a fully connected layer. How do I compute a fully connected layer? And this is where we come back to actually something that's very close to LinPack. The way we compute a fully connected layer is really a matrix matrix multiplication, right? So we want to have this output vector and we just arrange these weights that are um, going from X1 to, to the first neuron and the second one in a nice way and then we get a matrix matrix multiplication for fully connected layers. Of course, um, in deep neural networks, fully, there are not so many fully connected layers so there is a rather small amount of matrix matrix multiplication in here. But this is uh, perfect for GPUs. The second layer type that is very often seen, uh, it's actually dominating the performance of these uh, deep neural networks for image recognition at least, but it's true for most of them, um, are uh, convolutional layers. So there are two different way, uh, four different ways to evaluate convolutional layers, actually more, but, but four different major ways to do this. So the first category is the direct convolution where you just actually apply your convolution operator point by point, and then just compute the convolution. It's very simple. You can rearrange this in a very clever way to make this more amenable to GPUs. That's called the IM2Call method, where you just um, change the data layout and, um, well, reduce I.O. complexity, basically. Furthermore, you can actually apply convolutions by transforming the convolution filter as well as the image itself to an alternative space. And, for example, you could transform it into the reciprocal space in FFT, where the convolution can then easily be applied as a Hadamard product between these two operators. And then, of course, you have to FFT forward, you have to apply your convolution, and then you FFT backward. 
Right? So this is very beneficial if you have very large convolution operators that touch a huge part of the spectrum. And you can have a Wienerograd convolution which is similar to the FFT, you transform to a different space and apply the operation and you transform back. So again, if you want to know all the details, you can look at this, um, at the paper here. But what I want to point out is again the work depth analysis. And here we have the uh, very similar result to before. We see that there is an incredible amount of parallelism in the work and the very little depth only for all of the methods. So again, perfect for parallel computing. Right? So this is something that is actually uh, really nice. And we can also see that the n, the mini batch size, is basically a multiplicative constant in all of those, um, uh, in all of those equations. Okay. So let me now talk a little bit more about, I talked about uh, the parallelism at the layer level. Right? So I did a work depth analysis for each of the layer types. And now let me talk about the parallelism at the overall framework level. So how can we now parallelize the deep learning problem um, for real? So here we again have our input example. And the first type of parallelism is called model parallelism. There will be three total that we can exploit in deep learning. So the idea for model parallelism is that we take an example or a set of examples right, a mini batch, and we run it through the network, and here we parallelize each layer by itself. So the different colors here are different compute elements. So this is, for example, very suitable for vectorization or SIMT parallelism on GPUs, right? So this is what everybody does. In a distributed memory system, uh, not so much, so model parallelism is used rarely because you require a very low latency and very tight coupling between these elements at this level, okay? So, but if you want to do this in distributed memory system, then uh, this is rather interesting because you can now distribute the parameters across different processors, which means the 32 gigabyte that you would need to hold a full model in a single GPU, well, if you have two GPUs, you would only need 60 gigabyte if you had four, uh, 16. If you had four, you would only need eight gigabytes. So this is a way to reduce your state per processing element. The problem is, of course, your mini batch has to go through all processors, very obvious, and the backpropagation requires an all-to-all -all communication at each of the layers. Okay, so this is not used too often. Um, the second kind of parallelism uh, we call pipeline parallelism. The idea here is, this is used more often, that you again, of course, you, you take a mini batch, right? it's always the same, or oh, an, an, an example from a mini batch, and then each of the layers is processed on a different processing elements. So here the green one is a different GPU than the blue one is a different GPU than the brown one. So the big benefit here is that actually you can still um, distribute the layers just in the other dimension across the different compute elements. You have a very sparse communication pattern because only GPU 1 talks only to GPU 2, not to GPU 3. Right? And um, you can arrange this as a very convenient pipeline. But of course, as the downside, the mini batch still needs to be copied through all the processors. The last mode is actually the most used mode for parallelization, and this is called data parallelism. And it's relatively intuitive. The idea here is that you take multiple examples of your mini-batch, so sub-batches of the mini-batch, and you run them completely independently through multiple different instances of your network in different GPUs. Of course, at the end, you need to update all the parameters, and this is where the all-reduce comes in that I mentioned before, right? Yeah, the idea is that this is a very, very nice, uh, actually a very efficient solution. It's very easy to implement. This is why this is the prevalent parallelization mode of deep networks, even though all of them exist. And the problem is, of course, that you now have all the parameters. You have the full network, the full state, at every single compute element. Right? If it doesn't fit your GPU, you're out of luck. Right? So you need to do something else. Um, okay, but obviously what you can do is you can combine those three modes of parallelism. You can use hybrid parallelism, which combines, for example, data parallelism and model parallelism, and even pipeline parallelism. So this is what most advanced frameworks today do. They offer you ways to combine this into these different layers. Okay, wonderful. So now the question is, let's talk about data parallelism, because that is the most prevalent way to um, have uh, updates, right, or to, to distribute data. So what can we do in order to make this more efficient? Well, oh, actually in order to implement this. One way is we can have all the uh, weights in a central position, uh, in, in a central node. So we have four training agents here, and we put all the weights into a parameter server. This was the first mode um, that this was run at. And, and if you're with an HPC background, you, you can kind of uh, cringe a little bit when you hear parameter server, because you, you see immediately this could be a bottleneck. Right? Because imagine you have 10,000 of these training agents and they're all sent to one server, and that's exactly the problem. But what you do with these training agents, you basically send your 
your weight gradient to the parameter server and you receive the updated weights from the parameter server. Okay? Of course, the parameter server is sharded, which means there are actually multiple physical machines, one logical server, but consisting of multiple physical machines that are responsible for a subset of the parameters each. Okay? You can again write down what the uh, com computational complexity or the communication complexity in that case is, and you see the linear term here in the, in the volume, data volume again. So it's kind of, eh. okay. The other way to do this is called decentral. This is more the HPC way, where we have the training agents, so again, these four training agents, but the idea is now, instead of sending my data to some centralized location to sum it up, we just employ all reduce, right, like we would do in MPI, um, in order to get the global, global sum of the data. Right? And you, we can employ one of these algorithms, and in fact, if we are clever, we use a good MPI library, and we don't even worry about the all reduce because we rely on our vendor to implement a good MPI all reduce for us. Right? And, and that's, that's basically it. We can use other optimizations as well. We can use uh, MPI topologies, neighborhood collectors, RMA. We can use all of these things to optimize the performance of these networks. In fact, um, the parameter server can also be optimized. It can be made hierarchical, which will get us to a logarithm term here, but it will in introduce also another logarithm term in the latency, so it's also problematic. Right? So the best goal from, I mean, from a theoretical perspective for large scalability is really using a decentral method um, for parameter updates. Okay, but now there is another dimension to this problem that we uh, need to explore, and the idea is um, how do we actually, in the centralized mode, so let's now assume parameter server for a minute, right? how do we actually do this communication? So we could, of course, send the weights and then wait until the parameter server sends us the new weights. Right? This is called the synchronous method. Right? So this may be slow because we need to wait for the parameter server and if one of, the, one of these training agents comes late, well, we need to wait for the last one. Right? So we have this straggle problem. Another way to handle this is actually we could just not wait and we could always send our data to the parameter server and the parameter server just sends, up, uh, sends us weights back that he just has, he or she, of course. Um, but that's also not the greatest idea because it may happen that one of the training agents is extremely slow and we never get updates in time from that agent. So there is an intermediate way to do this. It's called the stale synchronous um, method. The idea here is that we bound uh, the asynchronity Basically, if one parameter, server, uh, sorry, if, if one training agent is more than k steps ahead, the slowest one, then it will wait until the slowest one catches up. Right? So we can basically bound the asynchronity. And, and these methods, they have been used uh, in the past, beginning from 2011. Um, disbelief moved it to distributed memory systems, and this is basically what we do today. Right? Okay. So, and it really trades off statistical performance because of course this is the least statistical performance way, right? Because we may never get the right data, but it's the most hardware performant way because we will always be busy doing something, we never wait. And this is the most statistically performant way because we always have the correct data, but we, the least hardware performant way because we may always wait for somebody. So we can do something very similar for the decentralized method, and the idea is basically the same. We can have a synchronous decentralized method, which is employing all reduce, MPI all reduce, the blocking one. We can have a bounded asynchronous method, which could be employing MPI I all reduce, so something that uh, I introduced to the MPI specification a while ago. Or we can have a fully asynchronous method where we just don't wait ever, right? So it's, it's basically the same. We can also talk about completely different models here. For example, we could employ gossip. So we're not even all the nodes may be reached, okay? And then we can take this line from consistent to inconsistent even further. We have synchronous SGD, stale synchronous, asynchronous, but we could even say, well, we could use another even le less synchronous way where we have uh, so-called model uh, averaging. And the idea is that somehow, well, whenever we get an update from some server, we will just decay that update by um, physical forces, so some spring model or, so, or some, some other model. Um, with the lateness of that update, right? So we just reduce the importance. Furthermore, if we go really inconsistent, what we can actually do is we can do a so-called ensemble learning. We can learn multiple networks completely independently, right? And then employ an averaging function to do the actual prediction. This, this could, in fact, be another network <laughs> or another network of networks, right? So you can do this recursively as long as you want. So this is the most asynchronous way. So now, just uh, to give you some more ideas about communication optimizations in the last minutes. So there are many, many different ways that we can actually optimize these updates. So one of them is sufficient factors, but I don't have enough time to talk about this, so, so let me skip this. But the most prevalent one is to use lossy compression somehow. 
when sending the data and accumulating the error before we send the data, before, the error that we lose or that we introduce by compressing locally. One of those ways to do this is quantization. We basically say, well, I have a 32-bit weight, but let me quantize this down to a, lar uh, to a smaller uh, range of numbers. Let's say 16 bits or 8 bits or, or 1 bit. Right? And this has been done, so, so low precision is kind of standard, but for waiting, uh, for, sorry, for sending the weight updates, even one bit SGD has been employed, where we basically send one bit per weight. It's just a direction, right? So this works, I'm, I'm not kidding. Uh, for some cases, it doesn't work for all cases. The second way to, uh, to reduce the communication volume, because this is the major bottleneck, the communication. Second way to reduce the communication volume is, is sparsification. And the idea here is that we actually don't send all the weights, we just say, well, let's just send the top 10 weights. Right? We have 1,000 weights, and we just pick the largest 10 and send them. And we accumulate the other ones locally until they become the largest 10, and then we will send them. You can prove that this will eventually converge, right? but you only send 1% of your data ever. So this is also an interesting one. This is actually something that we've uh, experimented with in my lab. And another way to deal with, uh, actually a necessary way to deal with this is that you um, have to assume when you do this that each of the nodes, again here are four nodes, one, two, three, four, each of the nodes may have a different subset of the parameters that are large. Right? This is your parameter space, and the, the white ones are the zeros that you're not sending, and the black ones are the non-zeros that you're sending. And each of these nodes will have a different subset, and as you go up, as you sum these two, the vector itself will get denser and denser. And at the end, it'll be relatively dense, depending on the distribution of your parameters. So we found in a study that this, is, this works well. So we did this on, on Pittstein. So you can get a speed up of, of nearly two. And if you have a really bad network, in fact, on EC2, uh, you can get a speed up of 20. Right? So this is one of those major messages. If you do communication optimization, and if you want to show that your communication optimization is great, um, really go to a very bad network. And then you will, you will see a lot of impact. On, on Pittstein, um, you, don't, you don't see such a big impact. Um, but the accuracy is basically the same, so this is a very interesting result. And you can find it at the, at the bottom in, in archive. Okay, so then there are two more things I want to cover very quickly, because they're also very important for um, parallelism in deep learning. One is architecture search. So I mentioned at the beginning that these networks themselves, the, the structure of the network, is usually designed by humans, like LXNets, LXNet. Alex Krasnevsky came up with this LXNet and named it after himself. So, but what you can actually do is you can employ different optimization strategies to find a good network as well. Right? But then we get into a complete nirvana here with the computation costs. Because remember, you need to train each network before you can tell how good it is. And if you do uh, reinforcement learning or evolutionary algorithms for developing these networks, then you may have to train many, many networks, each of them taking weeks to converge, very high uh, computational cost. So for example, Oak Ridge did this in an experiment. They ran um, 24 hours on the full machine for training one network that gave them 2% higher accuracy than um, the untrained network or the unlearned network. And you can now compute what the actual cost of 24 hours of the full uh, Titan machine is, and, and that is quite expensive. Right? And then with that, I want to close my talk, and I basically want to well, make this a call to action. So the idea of the survey was to really connect the deep learning community to the HPC community, so where we have a clear analysis, what are the computational pieces of this, um, of this deep learning field? And, and interestingly, this didn't quite exist before we did it. Unfortunately, it ended up being 16, uh, 60 pages. Um, but we have a full analysis of parallelism, distribution, synchronization, much more than I could cover in that talk. The talk was actually rather shallow compared to the overall, um, uh, to the full survey. There's additional content like uh, GANs and autoencoders and RNNs and LSTMs. I didn't talk about recurrent networks at all, but these are actually used for um, voice recognition and translation. But the idea is really that we should try to understand how to bridge the gap between this field of deep learning and the field of HPC. And I think it's happening naturally right now, but it would be very good to accelerate this a little bit. So thank you very much, and I'm open for questions.